I'm Liz Faubliss, and this is Currents. A call to action from U.S. bishops for religious liberty. Plus, more than two years later, helping to improve lives in Haiti. When we talk about that we're going to build Haiti back better, that can't happen unless we invest in Haiti's children, and that's exactly what this race is supporting. And alumni from one Catholic college get into the spirit of volunteerism. It's just a, a great opportunity for um, alumni of, of Catholic universities to just uh, give back to the community that they're, that they're serving. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Our Most Cherished Liberty, that is the title of a comprehensive statement on religious freedoms and the indisputable rights of Catholics as American citizens, authored by the U.S. Bishop's Ad Hoc Committee on Religious Liberty. The committee issued the statement to address the church's concerns about several key issues that threaten religious consciousness. This includes the most publicly argued affront to Catholicism, the government's controversial contraception mandate. Under that rule, most religious employers provide free contraceptives to their employees through their health insurance plans. Last month, Pope Benedict XVI appointed chairman of the Ad Hoc Committee on Religious Liberty, Bishop William Lorry, as the new Archbishop of Baltimore. This, as meetings at the White House and testimony before Congress, made Archbishop-designate Lorry one of the most visible faces of the U.S. Catholic Church. He's been described as the leading voice among the nation's Roman Catholic bishops against the Obama administration's HHS rule, and I had the distinct pleasure of speaking with His Excellency earlier today Day about what he has determined to be concrete examples showing that religious liberty is under attack. Your Excellency, before we start, I would first like to extend our fondest congratulations on your appointment to Archbishop of Baltimore, and we wish you the very, very best. Thank you so much, Liz. It's going to be exciting uh, serving our nation's oldest uh, see and uh, I hope and pray that it'll prove to be a good place uh, from which to help defend religious liberty. It is quite an appointment, Your Excellency. And, and that being said, you begin the statement that we're talking about today with, we are Catholics, we are Americans. And you passionately remind us that the two are not exclusive of each other. This distinction, is this at the heart of the issues that inspired your statement? Uh, it's very important. Um, the Church's teaching on religious liberty um, is really a wonderful guide to human dignity and to what constitutes a just society. And it really fits well with the vision of our founding fathers who understood that we are endowed with certain basic rights by our creator. Among these is religious liberty. And indeed in the Bill of Rights, it is the first of our liberties that is listed and as our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, said, this is the liberty that is uh, so very, very basic because it goes uh, to our relationship with God. Your Excellency, as you just mentioned, religious liberty does extend beyond what we are permitted to practice within the church. It also entails our contributions to the common good of all. Now, the concern is this contribution we make is being limited by what it seems to be the state is trying to do. Is this part and parcel a problem that the government is missing or ignoring? What we have observed uh, over time is an erosion of religious liberty due to bad laws, bad court decisions, um, and of course uh, an increasingly secular culture. However, the HHS mandate has put uh, the work of defending religious liberty on steroids. And what is happening here is that uh, the accommodations which um, people of faith and conviction have enjoyed for generations with regard to following their conscience on life issues is being taken back. This is not a case of the church trying to tell the government what to do. It is rather a case of the government trying to tell the church who the church is and what the church must therefore do. And uh, we must push back. We're really trying to preserve the liberty we have. We're not trying to uh, carve out any special privilege for ourselves. 
what is the next mission for you to preserve our religious liberties? And what are you asking parishes and dioceses and, and your brother bishops to do in order to help push this, this cause forward? A number of things are in the offing. One of the things that um, the statement itself recommends is prayer. And so we're recommending that all dioceses celebrate what we call a fortnight of freedom, the two weeks running up to the um, uh, to the to July the fourth. The second thing that is in the offing uh, is that the um, administration will be um, giving opportunity for comment regarding the rules that will surround the so-called accommodation that the administration announced in February, whereby um, insurance companies would pay for the so-called preventive services rather than the church herself. It's going to be very, very important that all members of the church um, be guided toward and help toward making good comments in order to defend our liberties Thirdly, uh, we should continue to contact our uh, congressional representatives and tell them that we still want uh, something like the Respect for the Rights of Conscience Act, which is stalled in the House of Representatives. And then finally, I think all of us have to alert our friends and our neighbors. We have to go viral with this so that uh, not just... Uh, those who are particularly interested in this will take note, but even those who are currently taking religious liberty for granted. And there's a lot of very good people out there who don't realize the threats we're facing. We have to enlist them, bring them on board. All right, Archbishop. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do, and our prayers are with you as you continue to speak out. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Liz, and God bless you, and God bless everybody who's listening to this broadcast. Thank you. Well, there's more currents ahead. One year older for Pope Benedict. You'll want to stick around for that and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Liz Faubless. Coming up later, bringing new life to seniors in one Brooklyn community. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. A big day at the Vatican as Pope Benedict turns 85 today. And as we hear from Rome reports, the Holy Father's birthday comes just before another important date. On April 16, 2005, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger turned 78 years old. Two days later, he took part in the conclave to elect the man who would follow John Paul II. What happened 24 hours later is now part of history. Abemus Papam. Eminentissimum ag reverendissimum dominum. Dominum Josephum. Sancte Romane Ecclesiae. Cardinalem Ratzinger. Qui sibi nomen in posuit Benedicti decimi sexti. He was elected Pope seven years ago, and during his pontificate, he's written three encyclicals and has taken 30 trips in and outside of Italy. As a whole, he's visited 21 countries and five continents. And aside from his seventh anniversary as Pope, he'll also turn 85 on April the 16th. As a way to celebrate his birthday, on April 20th, free beer will be handed out in the plaza of the Regensburg Cathedral. That same day, the Leipzig Symphony Orchestra will perform at the Vatican. And in the town where he was born, a special stamp has been designed so that all the letters mailed out that day will show his image. Above all, I will pray for him and leading by example, I'll also try to bring Christ to many people. Yeah, I'd like to say happy birthday, Pope Benedict the 16th, and thank you so much for all your work, all your hard efforts that you, you know, give to us, the Catholic Church. We just love you to death, and I hope you have a very happy birthday and long life. 
as a gift, okay. I'd like to give the Pope a little more time to himself, and I hope he gets to enjoy the day with his brother. Since the year 2005, the month of April has had a special meaning for Benedict XVI, both for his birthday and, of course, because he was elected Pope. And we wish Pope Benedict a very happy birthday and keep him in our prayers. Well, amid renewed allegations, the Vatican says it is not hiding anything in connection to the kidnapping of a teenage girl almost 30 years ago. 15-year-old Emanuela Orlandi, the daughter of a Vatican employee, disappeared on June 22, 1983. Among the rumor, rumors that is circulating since then, the kidnapping was connected to the 1981 assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II. A separate theory has the girl buried in the same grave as a former leader in the Roman underworld. Prosecutors allege that the Vatican has withheld information about the case, an allegation the Holy See's spokesman denies. Back in this country, Mitt Romney's search for a vice presidential running mate is underway. The probable Republican nominee has tapped a longtime advisor to oversee the vetting process. The list of potential candidates includes a number of pro-life politicians, including New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, and Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan. All four are Catholic. Meanwhile, efforts are underway in Mitt Romney's adopted home state of Massachusetts to oppose an initiative that would legalize assisted suicide. The Massachusetts Alliance Against Doctor Prescribed Suicide is made up of medical professionals, ethicists, disability advocates, and regular citizens. On Friday, the Alliance hailed a vote by the Vermont state rejecting a bill that would have legalized assisted suicide. The group is calling on Massachusetts voters to turn down a similar ballot initiative in November. From Northern Ireland, two men in their early 20s have been fined for posting anti-Catholic messages on Facebook. According to the newspaper The Caraman, the pair posted a number of messages, including one in which they threatened to kill all Catholics. A judge called the postings inappropriate and stupid. One of the men was fined close to $400, while the second received a fine of more than $600. A politician who was reportedly named in one of the Facebook postings said he feared for his family's safety. He added that no one would get away with making such comments on the street. Well, it may be a comedy, but not everybody is laughing. The Catholic League says the Three Stooges movie is not just another remake. The film's plot involves the Stooges raising money for their orphanage, which is run by nuns. One of the nuns is played by model Kate Upton wearing a, quote, nun bikini. A second nun, played by Seinfeld co-creator Larry David, is named Sister Mary Mengele, a reference to the Nazi war criminal known as the Angel of Death. The Catholic League is encouraging people to contact 20th Century Fox. Finally, there are many programs to help children in the third world, but one group is allowing that assistance to continue into adulthood. Rome Reports has those details. Hundreds of thousands of people have adopted a child even though they've never directly met. It's all part of a program that makes sure the child will have enough to eat and an education while growing up. But years later, what happens when the child becomes an adult? Well, back in 1986, Italian Giuseppe Rotuno from the organization La Civilità dell'Amore decided to keep on helping these people, even as adults. We saw that it was necessary for us to make a jump. These children became adults. Then came the adopt-a-father, which means a whole family, including everything in an educational role, a role in the formation of new generations with the strength of the labor of their hands. In the first place, it creates jobs. The father knows that he has not just received money for the sake of receiving, he had to work. And these fathers are responsible. They're creating a level of cooperative zones to manage what they receive and create opportunities to give more fruit. First, missionaries give the NGO information on exactly what type of programs are needed in different developing countries. The programs depend on individual donations, but the NGO doesn't receive a dime from these donations. One can make a direct deposit to the bank account of missionaries who then implement the programs. So for 25 euros, one can adopt a father, so to speak, for a week. With the money, he'll then be able to perform different jobs, like building a well, teaching children, planting crops and trees, or even building school benches. It's all about doing jobs that help improve their community. 
nelle infermierie. They work in schools, nursing homes, camps, in the workshops of carpenters, all the fundamental activities at the village level to promote and push the lives of entire communities that need these roles that are helped by adopting a father, adopting the head of a family. It's a project with an impact. If a teacher teaches for 25 children, 25 euros is a lot because 25 children learn, but also for a father to help his own children for their health or to eat. In time, people who choose to donate also receive a letter from the parent, where he writes about how the project is helping him and his family. The NGO's website shows that these projects are already underway in countries like Congo, India and Bolivia, but requests are coming in from all over the world. The mission may seem overwhelming at times, but really there's nothing like the gift of opportunity. Stay tuned, there's more Currents Ahead. It was a great day for a walk on Saturday and a local parishioner got her feet moving for a good cause. Since the earthquake, uh, the work has become much more urgent and this particular run is to raise money to build schools, pay for teacher salaries, teacher training, school uniforms for the kids, books, so that's why everybody's here. Welcome back. For most of the country, it is a regular work day, but in a couple of New England states, it is Patriots Day, and that means the Boston Marathon. More than 22,000 people participated in the annual race today in unseasonably high temperatures. Kenyan natives took first place in both the men's and women's marathons. And it seems like this is the time to get in the racing spirit. One local parishioner took part in a race in Central Park this weekend, part of an effort to make a difference in Haiti. Concern Worldwide is an international humanitarian organization. We work in 25 of the world's poorest countries. Um, we directly reach 9.5 million people, and what we do is we work to eliminate extreme poverty. So Concern has been working in Haiti since 1994, um, and Haiti is obviously the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It has had long-standing chronic issues even before the earthquake hit in 2010. Obviously, since the earthquake, uh, the work has become much more urgent and this particular run is to raise money to build schools, pay for teacher salaries, teacher training, school uniforms for the kids, books, so that's why everybody's here. Surprisingly, education is not free in Haiti like a lot of uh, countries in the world, so it's very difficult. A lot of children are not, they, they don't have the privilege of an education without support from organizations or families or private donors. Only one in two children in Haiti are in school and that was actually before the earthquake. When the earthquake happened, obviously anywhere in the earthquake zone, so many schools were destroyed or absolutely wiped out. The other thing that happened was you obviously had so many people displaced and what that means is you literally had a million people and thousands of children living in tent cities without access to schools. You know, without education, you know, when we talk about that we're gonna build Haiti back better, that can't happen unless we invest in Haiti's children. And that's exactly what this race is supporting. Well, we're hoping to make a small contribution to education in Haiti. Well, my best friend Lucy is from Haiti and she talk, told me about the run. And I was very excited to, you know, be part of it. I am from Haiti and uh, before I left the country, it was a beautiful place, and uh, day after day, the country just keep on going down. So I'm hoping with this thing, we can uh, bring Haiti back to what it used to be, and bring tourists back to come and visit my country. My country is a beautiful, beautiful place. We spread the word through all different channels. We just try to get the word out to as many New Yorkers as possible. We did reach out to the Haitian community, who Franz Luce is a member of here in New York. Um, she's someone who really stands out to us. Her just as an individual alone, the last I checked, raised $610 between her and her team. And I did this in, uh, I found out about the race uh, about two and a half weeks before today. So I did this all in like two weeks. It, it, this is only a start. And if we have more events of this nature, I think it definitely is, you know, going to get the rest of the country, you know, it, it's going to let them know, listen, Haiti is not a lost cause. They, there's work to be done. And let's, you know, let's, uh, let, let's, uh, let's start this. Let's uh, uh, let's do this thing. You know what I mean? Our goal is 155,000, and we've already raised nearly 190, which is just phenomenal. 
I am confident that the money I raise today will go to working towards education. I do. I believe it. So all of these people out here today have, have made a huge, huge difference for the children of Haiti. It's going to allow us to do so much on the ground and actually invest in them. And we have to mention, Franz Luz finished the four-mile race with a time of 34 and a quarter minutes. Really great work all around. Don't go anywhere. There's more Currents Ahead. A group of Catholic alumni brighten a community space for some local seniors. They're helping us today beautify our dining room uh, areas and the living room areas for our seniors who are served here. Finally tonight, it really is beginning to look a lot like summer. With temperatures well into the 70s and 80s over the last couple of days, it's a great time to be outside and also to get your hands dirty. And that is exactly what a group of alumni from the University of Scranton did at the Catholic Charities Sheepshead Nostrand Senior Center. This past Saturday, graduates of the Jesuit-run school planted a tranquility garden to kick off National Volunteer Week. Today we are planting a tranquility garden in our Sheep's Head No Strength Supportive Services North program. The tranquility garden is going to be a garden where my older adults can walk through the development, come, have peace of mind, have quiet. It's going to be a somber environment. It's going to be a beautiful environment for them to come and enjoy and have a safe place for them to just sit and think. If you saw us in action today, not only are we beautifying this center that's accessed by more than 300 seniors on a daily basis, but we also threw a community event as well. We had a DJ, we had food, our vendors donated their services. Right foot, let's go. Left foot, let's go. I visit for, for lunch, I come for exercises, morning exercises, dancing, and uh, I visit all uh, uh, birthday celebration, and uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I was for a language program. Senior centers and NORCs and social adult day programs provide prudent services for older adults who through these economic times may not be provided with meals, who may be socially isolated, who may not have transportation, who may not be able to have the quality of life that they should have. Most senior citizens are on fixed income and a lot of us are not mobile so we could like walk over here or either our home attendants could bring us over here at our senior centers, the seniors receive help with uh, hot lunches, hot meals. They receive help applying for different entitlements. It's a time where they can come together and really lessen their isolation within the community. We learn a lot of things. We meet different peoples, different cultures, and we talk about the past and the present. Oh, here's the supplies, and I'm just going to ask that everybody get what they need so we can start our paint job. We are here today with the University of Scranton alumni group here kicking off the National Volunteer Week. They're helping us today beautify our dining room uh, areas and the living room areas for our seniors who are served here. It's just uh, a great opportunity for um, alumni of, of Catholic universities to just uh, give back to the community that they're, that they're serving. They provide a lot of activities for us. Uh, they, they give us a sense of community, and I, I, I give them all the praise that, that I can. It's important that people help seniors out. Um, you know, seniors have done so much for us and continue to inspire us with the lives that they lead. So I think that, you know, it's something as a younger generation, we should all take care of our seniors. We certainly should. Well, that is all for this edition of Currents. Coming up tomorrow, just under five months since the introduction of a new mass translation, a look at the intricacies and challenges of the updated Roman Missal. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Fawbless. Thank you for watching and have a good night.